honestly, it's like a washer dryer thing. Like, I feel like I need a washer and dryer to be like fully happy in my life. And a uh, tiny house just seems a lot more well suited for like a full size washer and dryer. <laughs> Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 205 with Deanna Michelson. Have you ever seen a shed or a building that is not a house and looked at it and said, I want to live there. I could turn that into a tiny home. Well, that's what my guest, Deanna Michelson, did. Deanna was able to eliminate $30,000 of debt in two years by renovating and living in a 9 by 12 tool shed. In our interview today, I'll ask Deanna what it took to turn the shed into a beautiful little tiny house, why she got kicked out, and what she's doing next. We also talk about her coaching business, Stoked Coaching, and what kind of clients she's hoping to work with. And of course, we talk about Deanna's next tiny house, which will be a house on wheels and is tentatively called Shed 2.0. I hope you stick around. But before we get started, did you know that I personally send tiny house newsletter every week on Tuesdays? It's called Tiny Tuesdays, and it's a weekly email with tiny house news, interviews, photos, and resources. It's free to subscribe, and I even share sneak peeks of things that are coming up, ask for feedback about upcoming podcast guests, and more. It's really the best place to keep a pulse on what I'm doing in the tiny house space and also stay informed of what's going on in the tiny house movement. To sign up, go to thetinyhouse.net slash newsletter, where you can sign up for the Tiny Tuesdays newsletter. And of course, you can unsubscribe at any time. I will never send you spam. And if you ever don't want to receive emails, it's easy to unsubscribe. So again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash newsletter. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy next week's Tiny Tuesdays newsletter. All right, I am here with Deanna Michelson. Deanna is a multidisciplinary designer currently working as a visual merchandiser for Patagonia. Always fascinated by alternative forms of shelter, Deanna's first tiny house experience came in response to the high cost of living in California's Bay Area. She was able to eliminate $30,000 of debt in two years by renovating and living in a 9 by 12 tool shed. The experience was so liberating and empowering that she started Stoked Coaching to help others make their dreams a reality. She's currently designing Shed 2.0, which will be on wheels so she can't get kicked out of it. Deanna Michelson, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, very excited to have you on the show. We've uh, we've been in touch via email for uh, a few months now, just kind of chatting back and forth about how we would make the interview happen. And it's great to have you here. I was hoping um, you could kind of tell us the story of, you know, discovering the shed and, you know, when you see something like that, and we'll post pictures on on the show notes page, uh, decrepit would be a word that I might use to describe it. So, so how do you go from seeing that and saying like, okay, I'm going to live there, or I'm going to I'm going to make it into something, a place where I actually would want to live? I mean, honestly, I've got to give Chip and Joanna Gain some credit because I've watched every single episode of Fixer Upper. I honestly don't know like where the idea came from, other than that I saw that shed and uh, I just saw a tiny house when I looked at it. I don't know how else to describe Mm -hmm. it. And honestly, so many people thought that I was crazy. But once I started working through the steps of the renovation, it started to become clear to other people that there was actually potential there. Right. It's kind of a diamond in the rough. And a little bit of backstory was that the shed was in my sister's backyard in Oakland and they were just giving me a tour of the house that they had just moved into and sort of half jokingly (laughs) was like hey like can I live in the shed and then they they sort of took me seriously and and we made it happen that's awesome so you so you actually moved into the main house while you renovated the shed yes yeah there was a spare bedroom 
in the in the sort of half basement of the main house that I was able to live in while I worked on the shed, which was super convenient um, in terms of, you know, having to do all the work on sort of nights and weekends while I worked a full time job. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, for anyone listening who's done it or anyone who's considering doing it, um, what advice would you have for them? (laughs) Don't (laughs) know. I mean, it's definitely, uh, it was a passion project, you know, and so that's what got me through. Yeah. And, you know, I guess if I had any advice to folks is like, stay connected to your vision and your why, you know, like Mm. for me paying off my debt was a big motivator. And I also had like mood boards of photos of beautiful tiny houses and, and whatnot. And those two things were kind of my motivation throughout the project, but also reminding yourself to take breaks and like do the other things in your life that bring you joy. You know, for me, that's like, going backpacking and hiking with my dog and, you know, finding time to continue to do those things while you're working full time and doing a project like this is really important. Yeah. I remember that feeling of like wanting to, to like go skiing or, or do a hike and, and like, it kind of felt like I was damned if I did and damned if I didn't. Cause if I did, if I did the fun thing, it was fun. But then I was like, oh, I could have been working on my tiny house and this just, it's taking forever. When is it going to be done? Yeah, it's all about balance, right? Totally, totally. So um, can you walk us through like what what was this shed and like what did you have to do to it to turn it into to a house? Yeah, I mean, I wrote about it sort of extensively in the blog that I think you will link to in the show notes, but mm-hmm. for anyone that wants to nerd out on the process. But essentially, first, it was like a demo, like getting all of the, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) rodent excrement and uh, dry rot wood and like just whatever had accumulated. There was a ton of just soil that had built up on and around it, which is which had sort of rotted away Mm -hmm. parts of the framing. So the, the first part was just sort of clean up and demo. Yep. And then there was a there was a period of time where I was working more on the sort of structural integrity of it. When I when I peeled back all the layers, I discovered that it was completely missing the entire back wall. Mm-hmm. And it was built so close to the neighbor's house that we had to sort of reverse engineer this back wall and slide it into place rather than building it in a traditional manner of framing and siding and that sort of thing. Yeah. And resurfacing the concrete floor i learned how to use a (laughs) cement polishing like grinder or what have you um shout out to the tool library in oakland by the way um if you live in the bay area um it's an incredible resource and if you have a tool library in your area it's a great way to borrow a tool for a few days that you would otherwise have to buy yeah it's so cool that that you had that available and and even if you don't have a tool library what that you can rent for free you know, I rented all kinds of things just from the local hardware store, um, nailer for putting down hardwood floors, for example, like a tool that, that you don't need to own for one tiny house, but it sure is handy to have for the, the day that you install your floors. Totally. Yeah. I rented, um, a paint sprayer from Home Depot mm. to, to paint the inside and, and the exterior. And, uh, that was a tool I didn't need to own but was super helpful to have during the process and way cheaper to rent. Yeah, totally. And so the, the whole process, you know, it it is documented quite, quite beautifully on, on your blog on, on getstokedcoaching.com, which, you know, I'll link to, to that post. And, um, the whole process took a year. Yeah, roughly a year. Um, you know, I'm sure you experienced this with your tiny house. You're never really done with it. So yeah, I, I worked on it for, for sort of nine months to a year to get it sort of livable. And then mm-hmm. after I moved in, there's probably another six months or so of tinkering with things while I was living in tinkering. it. Tinkering. Yes. <laughs> Did you add insulation in your build or... I'm seeing a picture where the the walls are just kind of open. You're just looking at like the framed wall from the inside. 
Yeah. So I chose not to insulate it initially. Mm-hmm. The reasoning behind that was several fold. One was being a little bit worried about moisture and not being a hundred percent sure that it was waterproof. Mm-hmm. And also not being really sure that I wanted to live in a house that tiny. Right. And so I wanted to sort of feel it out for a little while before investing all that additional time and money into insulation and the interior cladding. Yep. And California is like warm enough that you won't die if you don't have insulation. It was yep. not pleasant yep. during the winter months, but it was doable. Mm-hmm. And that actually ended up being a pretty good decision because we ended up getting kicked off of the property Mm. not too long after I moved in. Oh, bummer. So I was kind of glad that I hadn't hadn't spent, you know, an extra two or three thousand dollars on the project. Yeah. So and this property was a rental property to begin with. Yeah. Okay. And so was did the, was it the shed that got you kicked off the property? No, no, no. Okay. And honestly, okay, good. <laughs> the, the property got bought and flipped and then they turned the shed into this little sort of like you know (laughs) she shed man cave thing of course and I think had I not done all the work that I had done on it they probably would have just torn it down so I saved the shed (laughs) you saved the shed yeah from from the before pictures it definitely looks like it was was worthy of a (laughs) teardown if if that was if you didn't have the time and energy and love to put into it for sure. In terms of what was in it, um, I'm looking at the SketchUp model, which is, is really cool that that you made one because it actually, I'm excited for people to see it just so they can get a sense. Because, you know, in the pictures, you only see like, you see one little corner and you see this thing over here. The SketchUp, you can really see the whole space. Um, was, it looks like there was just gravity feed water and and some electricity. Yeah, so the electricity was just an extension cord from the house. Okay. Which was another upgrade that I would have done had I been there longer. I was planning to put some more legit electric work into it. Yeah. And the the sink, yeah, was just gravity fed um, with a gray water bucket. I go into detail about that in the blog, but I think if I had stayed there longer, I also would have created some sort of gray water... uh, filter drainage into the yard rather than having to dump the bucket every day yeah but it worked well for the time that I was there and it was a great experience just in terms of learning how those systems work and don't work yeah absolutely and and I love this I love this example because now you're working on saving for a a big tiny house I guess we'll say a a tiny house on wheels Mm -hmm. and a lot of people kind of come to the tiny house movement and they go right for that, but it's a big financial stretch. And it sounds like this experience of the shed really allowed you to pay off a lot of debt and probably start saving money in a much more radical way than you would have been able to before. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wish that I had been able to stay in it longer because my next plan after paying off the debt was to save up for the tiny house on wheels. Yeah. But the experience of living in such a small space was invaluable just in terms of knowing what I really can Mm -hmm. live without and then the sort of creature comforts that are important enough to me. Like when I was design when I was designing the tiny house on wheels in SketchUp, I ended up I add another two feet so I can get a washer and dryer in here because that's really important to me versus other things that I've learned that I could kind of live without. Yeah. How much did you end up spending on the the shed build? I haven't like crunched all the receipts, but ballpark estimate, I would say four or five thousand dollars, which when you compare it to paying off 30 grand in debt, seems like worth it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and also, you know, in terms of your education and your, you know, learning how to build, um, potentially invaluable. Yeah. And low stakes, right? Like I was able to, yeah. you know, oh, I'm gonna cut a hole in this wall and see what happens. And I'm not super worried about it because right. I didn't spend, you know, 
hundreds of dollars on the plywood or whatever. <laughs> Seems like the biggest risk was like accidentally having the thing like collapse on you while you were in it and working on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I was fortunate to have some help from a contractor friend with some of the more structural improvements. That's awesome. I realized in the beginning, like, oh, I'm in a little bit over my head here. Uh, so I was able to phone a friend and, and learn a lot from him as well. Yeah. And it's it's cool, too, because I'm kind of getting back to what I was hinting at before is just like there are so many structures like this around. And if 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 those listening are like really dreaming of living tiny, but like a tiny house on wheels straight out the box is like not within their possibility or budget. You know, if you if you kind of expand your your viewpoint and say you see uh, a shed on on a neighbor or a friend's property that is it not being used you know that could be turned into a tiny house for a lot less than building a tiny house on wheels or buying one from scratch and then it, it kind of starts you on that journey yeah absolutely i mean my current project right now is i'm working on a uh, an upgrade of the camper in the back of my truck um i have an old toyota mm -hmm. tacoma and I, I used a sort of simpler version of the platform that I have for years now. And I've been able to spend that time with it and say like, oh, like I would add this if I were to build another one. Or I realize I don't actually need this thing that everybody tends to put in their own truck camper. Yeah. And so being able to test things out, like live in and with them before you commit to the big build and the big bucks seems like a really great way to do it. Yep. Yep. Nice. And and what's your vision for your your tiny house on wheels in terms of, you know, are you do you still want to live in the city in the tiny house on wheels? Um, are you going to travel in it? What, can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I like about tiny house on wheels is that you can move it. <laughs> um, so I could imagine living in a city or 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 somewhere a little bit more rural and I like the idea that you could sort of mm -hmm. choose between those two and try it out for a while um I would not plan mm -hmm. on moving it frequently like I've even thought about does it even really need to be on wheels could I do sort of a container home thing that I would just pay someone to move for me yeah but there's something about that just like knowing that you could move it yourself if you needed to I love that self-sufficiency and you know I have some pretty gnarly wanderlust and I'm a Sagittarius, so <laughs> okay. I like to keep my options open. Yeah. Well, the truck camper is a, is a great compliment to a tiny house on wheels just cause you know, they're not that mobile. So you can just, you can just jet off if you want to go and, and be away. Exactly. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm camping, I feel like I don't need a lot with me. Mm -hmm. I prefer that more mobile experience but i'm kind of a homebody when i am at home so the idea of having a slightly larger tiny house with a little bit more space to nest is a, is appealing to me yeah are you planning to do the build yourself i am yeah nice i again would probably have some folks help with some of the things that are a little outside of my comfort zone like gas and electricity and plumbing and that sort of yep. thing but um i feel pretty confident in being able to to build a house after my shed experiment <laughs> yeah i would probably go with stick frame just because uh -huh. i uh, that's how the shed was built and i really understand how that works and how everything works with that right I've tried to open my mind to some of the like more newfangled ways of building and they seem to have a lot of um, benefits, but I just like the good old fashioned stick framing personally. Yeah, there, there uh, is a lot to be said for stick framing and, and also just so many more people are out there who know how to stick frame a build too, like your contractor friend or, you know, just the people at the hardware store um, are, are going to be much more familiar with, with that kind of building method than SIPs or metal framing or, or anything like that. So um, would you consider a different tiny dwelling kind of in between 
shed 1.0 and shed 2.0, maybe a, a shed 1.5, some, some other conversion. Yeah. I mean, the other mobile dwelling option that really tugs at my heart stream is, um, renovating an Airstream trailer. Yeah. And actually my friend's book called the modern caravan. That's all about Airstream mm-hmm. renovations just came out today. Oh, cool. So it, it was just kind of funny timing that I happened to be on this podcast and, and I got her that copy of her book today. But yeah, I think Airstreams are really cool. I don't know about like live. Honestly, it's like a washer dryer thing. Like I feel yeah. like I need a washer and dryer to be like fully happy in my life. Yeah. And tiny house just seems a lot more well suited for like a full size washer and dryer. Certainly, certainly. There are like compact options, but but you can't beat the like full on washer and dryer. Yeah. Especially, you know, it seems like you enjoy the outdoors and as as I do as well, but it it all these outdoor activities come with additional clothing and gear and also additional laundry. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> after doing them. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The design for your tiny house, do you have any houses that you're kind of pulling on for inspiration? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know that I could off the top of my head name all of the builders and and the the designs, mm-hmm. but I have a pretty epic Pinterest board of inspiration. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And that's a great way to do it is to just kind of collect images that are inspiring to you and then you can kind of draw from those as you as you work on your design. Yeah. There, I, there's a lot of benefit, I think, in also having that collection and being able to notice like, oh, this same design has come up five different times. It must be something that yeah. I'm really drawn to. Yeah. So, um, you know, looking at your SketchUp model for your, your tiny house, it looks like it's, it's a shed roof and there are stairs up to a sleeping loft. Yes. Yeah. I initially was trying to go with a shorter model and do the sort of like dinette conversion bed but Uh uh-huh kind of realized as as I was thinking through it that that's something that I would be fine doing occasionally like on a weekend here and there but every single day probably not something that I want to deal with and my original bed my original plan also had this cool like ladder staircase thing that was sort of retractable but I have a dog Uh uh-huh and I let her sleep in the bed Mm -hmm. and that's something that is important to me. Yeah. And so I needed to put in a staircase so she would be able to access the sleeping loft. Yeah. For anyone who's ever tried, like it's somehow really not that hard to carry a dog up a ladder, but it's really hard to carry a dog down a ladder. I can imagine. And the dog's probably not very excited about it either. (laughs) Dog's not into it. Yeah. Um, I, it, it'll be almost a year. I have a basset hound now and he's like real top heavy. I, I can't, I can't carry him with one hand cause he literally just tips over. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, unfortunately the loft in, in my tiny house is, is off limits for poor parsnip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or if you're planning on building a tiny house with a ladder, maybe get a smaller dog. My dog is 50 pounds. Yeah. So probably there you go. not yeah. going to work with a ladder. Yeah. What are some other features in the in your shed 2.0 tiny house um, that you're excited about? Well, I have always loved tiny wood stoves. Uh huh. And I, it's a little superfluous because I've also realized that I wouldn't want a wood stove to be my only source of heat. I've lived in a year outside mm-hmm. of Portland for a while, and that was the only heat source, and it's pretty rough. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But I just love the ambiance and the feeling of lighting a fire. And so that's definitely something that I, you know, spend a little bit of extra square footage and and money on to have. Yeah. And it's, it's really smart to have multiple heat sources in a tiny house. Do you, do you have an alternate heat source planned? Yeah. I mean, honestly, a lot of the systems that I have sort of decided on for, for my next build, came from doing tiny house decisions. Oh, okay. 
and and reading through that guide but i so far what i think makes the most sense is to have a heated floor at least in the bathroom Mm -hmm. a mini split and then a wood stove for supplementary heat yeah well i as the author of tiny house decisions (laughs) i think that's a great idea (laughs) yeah it's like maybe a little overkill but i also feel like if you are making these concessions with you know, space and being willing to live in 300 square feet or less, it's okay to splurge a little on some of the, some of the things that will make that small space more comfortable. Yeah. And and what I love about your two heat sources in particular is that, you know, the mini split and the heated floor are going to require electricity, but the wood stove won't. So um, if you needed to be off grid or you found yourself off grid, you would still be able to to use that wood stove as your primary heat source. And unless something changes drastically, you're not getting like sub-zero temperatures in the Bay Area. So <laughs> you should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing I'm still sort of thinking through is, is I would like my house to be able to live anywhere. Mm-hmm. But it seems hard to design for that. You know, like I have family that lives in Montana, which is frigid. And I've also yeah. considered like living more in a desert environment, which gets really hot. Yeah. And it, it seems hard to design your tiny house on wheels such that it is optimized for any environment. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. I mean, more insulation is, is helpful for both hot and cold. So you've got that going for you. But of course, there's the, the issue of windows in a really hot, sunny environment turns, you know, you can end up creating a greenhouse for yourself yeah or making sure that your roof is strong enough to withstand you know several feet of snow if you end up in an environment that totally that happens totally so um you are you work for patagonia one of my very favorite clothing and gear brands um but you're also kind of pursuing a, a side a side project? Is it fair to call it that? Um, stoked coaching? Yeah, you could call it a side project. All right. All right. A side hustle, as, as some would call it. What um, can you tell tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I try not to use the word hustle because for me, this coaching endeavor really is about, it's less about making money and it's more about bringing value to other people's lives. Mm-hmm. But I had I had a life coach actually that was sort of stewarding me through this whole debt payoff mm. shed life journey and yep it really helped me put everything in perspective and I just realized yeah basically that if you could make a change in your life that significant that like other people should be able to do that too <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. like, I don't want to make it sound like it was easy because it wasn't easy, but it was right. possible. And even a few years before that, I might not have even considered, you know, being debt free a possibility or, you know, living yeah. in a tiny house in Oakland, the possibility. Right. And so you already had this coach when you kind of saw the shed and started talking about it or did that come afterwards? Yeah, I had been working with my coach uh, well before that. And we, we'd talked a lot about, you know, my financial situation and, and what I wanted to do to improve that, and what I just even what I wanted out of life and what my values were mm-hmm. clarifying what's important to me was really helpful. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, like lavish living environment is not actually that important to me. But freedom is like one of my top values. So being able to put that all on paper and then make your life decisions accordingly was a really powerful experience for me. Mm, Yeah. You know, on your blog, you've got a a great post about eating well on the, on the road. And you talk a little bit about, you know, that your work for Patagonia involves zhushing up retail stores, zhushing up retail stores. (laughs) And I, I love that word. My, my, my mom and aunt definitely say that word, but, um, can you can you kind of tell our listeners what judging up something means and also like how did you apply that to to the shed build cuz you know I I'm imagining as a visual merchandiser you are 
you're very good with with the visual aesthetics of a space and and there's no question that the shed looks really awesome so talk about like how you did that yeah i only recently learned how to spell zhuzh by the way and it's amazing it's z-h-u-z-h for anybody who's curious yeah i've always had like a propensity toward just like making things better like leaving it better than i found it Mm -hmm. and always been obsessed with like hgtv and that kind Mm -hmm. of thing i recently have been learning more about enneagrams i don't know if you or your listeners is interested in that at all but i'm a one and that the one is all about that like Mm -hmm. making things better and and always seeing possibility Mm -hmm. in potential and things yep but I think that the zhuzhability of something <laughs> it just comes with practice, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, it's not something that I was always good at. You know, I had to mess up a lot to be mm-hmm. able to hone that, like, intuitive sense of, like, oh, this this will look good here or this is the right color of this paint. Yeah. It's something that came with years and years of practice. And also... A lot of consuming, I mean, I guess for lack of a better word, media. So, you know, before social media, it's like books and going to the library and going to museums and, you know, thumbing through Dwell magazine. Yeah. Um, And now now that we have Instagram and Pinterest and uh, things like that, some of those things are a little bit more accessible. But just sort of curating. Sure what I like or what you like, you know, because it's subjective as well. So right. formulating your taste based on what you like. Yeah. And it it's kind of, I'm realizing now that, that, you know, tiny house living is kind of the ultimate form of curation because you've, you're essentially curating a house down to it's just essential parts and stripping away all, all the rest. Totally. Yeah. And, and you see, you know, people make like, I think you shared somebody recently who had put a sauna in their tiny house and, mm-hmm. you know, people make space for, you know, yoga or hammocks or whatever. You really get to see somebody's personality and their build uh, based on the, the things that they prioritize their space for. Yeah, definitely. And, and you really get to do that when you build a space for yourself. Totally. Um. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you were excited to to talk about on the show? I love that question, first of all. I love that you ask everybody that. I guess the only thing really is that it's worth mentioning that I was really anti-tiny house for quite a long time. <laughs> um, really? Not because of like living in small spaces, but I just feel like Similar to sort of like the whole van life thing, it really took off in this way Mm -hmm. that seemed kind of inauthentic at times. Yes. And I just really did not care for it. And then I met one person on a camping trip and I I won't say this person's name, but they lived out of their van and they had a tiny house back home. and something clicked where I was like, well, this person's cool. Like maybe tiny houses are cool. (laughs) Wow. I'm glad that person was cool. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe that sounds too judgy, but um, I guess I just say that to remind folks to like be open-minded about things, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But I I mean, I don't fault you for your, your initial take on tiny houses because I think that Tiny houses got really popular and mainstream through reality television and through Instagram and, and visual social media. And both both kind of tend to present it in only the kind of glamorous moments and, and none of the reality or or the the grittiness of of actual life. Totally. I love when people post photos and videos of their house when it actually has stuff in it. Yeah. Have you noticed like so many photos and videos of tiny houses are like perfectly staged and you're like, okay, cool. But like, where do you put the mop? (laughs) 
<laughs> or like, yeah. where's the yeah. dog food bowl go? You know, and so living for me in the shed allowed me to also recognize all those places for storage that you don't think about. Yes. And build that into my design. And yeah, I just love that authenticity and reality that some people put out there. It's important for that to be part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of mops, I don't like (laughs) I failed to put a place in my tiny house like for a broom that would be like away mm-hmm. so it's just kind of like always out like leaning up against a wall but take note listeners <laughs> figure out where the broom and mop go yeah <laughs> um random question for you just based on based on what i've seen of your blog it looks like you are a plant-based eater any any favorite plant-based eating uh cookbooks well i'm actually not a totally plant-based eater okay but I do love plant-based foods and incorporating them into my diet. Off the top of my head, my my favorite person right now that's doing plant-based recipes is Sarah Brith- Britton from My New Roots. Mm-hmm. Okay. She has a new membership service that you can sign up for that's called Grow. And you, you pay a certain amount of money per month. And then you have like unlimited access to all her recipes and videos. And- She's awesome. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then the the question that I that I like to ask all my guests um is, you know, what are two or three resources that that have helped you out along the way that that you'd like to share with with listeners and and that can be anything. Yeah, I mean, beyond the sort of obvious like YouTube videos of like how to install a deadbolt. <laughs> which are so, mm-hmm. super, super important. Super helpful. I already mentioned, you know, my friend Kate, who wrote the Modern Caravan book, but just design books in general were super important for me in my mm-hmm. design build process. Another one that I'll, that I'll mention specifically is Abode, which is by Serena Mitnick Miller. Mm-hmm. Really helped me make a lot of the aesthetic choices during my renovation and also shout out to the regular library on top of the tool library i have been really leaning back into utilizing my local library mm-hmm. for things like that of like oh i don't really need to own this book but i'd like to spend a few weeks with it yeah that's been a great resource and also a great thing for folks in tiny spaces to think about maybe i don't need to own this in my in my tiny space but I could like hang out with it for a little while yeah absolutely and also my shout out is to the to the digital library that you can you can get a lot of these books on your e-reader and then if you're like me you like to highlight and that's frowned upon for library books so then you can Mm. you can highlight your your digital library book yes yeah and audiobook too like getting audiobooks through Libby yeah that audiobooks and podcasts definitely fueled a large portion of my uh, nights and weekends <laughs> working on the shed. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's nice to have something to to kind of listen to in the background while you while you work on things. Cause in building there are so many repetitive tasks interrupted by times where you like really need to focus and and concentrate, but then like then long stretches of just like painting. Or mm-hmm. just like screwing in a bunch of screws in a in a line. Yes. Lots of repetitive, monotonous tasks. Yep. Well, um, I'll post links to Stoked Coaching on on the show notes episode for this page. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to say about about that work that you're doing and um, you know, what kinds of people you're you're looking to work with? Yeah, I mean I'm I'm really interested in working with folks that want to live a less traditional life Mm -hmm. and that aren't afraid to color outside the lines or maybe aren't afraid currently, but have a desire to do that. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. I would, I would love to work with, with folks that just want something different than what the mainstream has offered to us. Nice. Well, I think I think we'll just leave it there. Deanna Michelson, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. 
Thank you, Ethan. Thanks for, for making this for all of us. Thank you so much to Deanna Michelson for being a guest on the show today. You can find the show notes, including photos of Shed 1.0 and lots more, including a complete transcript of this episode at thetinyhouse.net slash 205. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 205. Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I will be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.